Hello, it's me, Valerie Monroe, and me, Bookwormy, and we are glad to be here reading again with you today. Today, we're going to pick up where we left off um, in Down the Swale. What was going on in Down the Swale? Well, if you remember, Brogdon and Aunt Hazel had just gone to the Wishing Meadow, and we had said about a month after he came home, something unexpected happened. What do you think it's going to be? I don't know. That's why it's so unexpected. Wow. Let's find out what it is. The only way to find out what it is is to read on. Let's read on. Okay. Early in the morning, a large truck came rattling down the steep driveway of the brown house. And if Broden could have read the words on the side of it, he would have known that it said moving van. He watched from underneath the wooden staircase as two men took many different boxes and all kinds of furniture out of the truck and carried them into the brown house. By mid-morning, the truck was completely empty and thirstily drinking glasses of water, Broden could hear the clinking of the ice cubes in the glasses. The larger of the two movers, a burly man with bulging muscles and hardly any hair on the top of his head, wiped his spready, sweaty brow with the back of his hand. Glad that's over and done with, Simp, he grunted. Simp, a shorter and skinnier fellow with floppy dark hair, pointy glasses, and a peculiar mole on his cheek, tilted his glass back and drained it. Me too, Mackie, he agreed, and beginning tomorrow, we've got to get started on our real work. You're positive this is the right place, Mackie asked. My contacts were quite specific, Simp answered. Lake Wahakmo. From the looks of things, it's smaller than I'd reckoned. Shouldn't be hard to find the little monster. Monster, Brogdon thought. Monster? Goosebumps popped out all over Brogdon's arms and legs. His scalp began to tingle, and even his hair stood on end. It seemed impossible, yet Brogdon couldn't help wondering if they were talking about Maggie. He continued listening, his ears straining to catch every word that Simp was saying. I figure we'll find us a boat tomorrow and get out on the lake. Then it'll only be a matter of time before we track her down. He glanced around nervously. Hey, you don't think anyone can hear us, do you? Nah. Mackie shook his head. I'm pretty sure we're the only folks that know or care that the lock baby is here. A grin spread across his face. Oh, do you see my cat, Poe? Just jumped behind us. And if all goes well, she won't be here long. His laugh was a wicked sounding cackle. Hey, you hear anything back from the lab or the aquarium? At the least, both of them have held firm with their offers. At least $1 million for her capture, grin simp. Let him battle it out, I say. Highest bidder gets the nasty, scaly beast. And we'll be rich, Mackie proclaimed. And don't forget famous, added Simp. The men strode up the front steps of the brown house and disappeared inside. Brogdon stood there, dumbstruck, with one thought running like a low rumble of thunder through his mind. Maggie's in danger. Maggie's in danger. It seemed too incredible to be true. Star starting tomorrow, those two terrible men were going to be in a boat on Lake Wahakmo hunting for Maggie. And it wouldn't take long for them to find her since Lake Wahakmo wasn't all that large. Oh, and when they did find her, Brogdon shuddered at the thought. In that instant, he knew what he had to do. He spent the afternoon walking around in front of the hut collecting large sticks. It pleased Aunt Gladys greatly. Oh, nice to see you helping to keep our property clean, she noted. Tidiness is so important. When he had counted the sticks and was satisfied with the number, he consulted Aunt Hazel, Aunt Hazel about the art of tying knots. Well, now, what kind of knot are you interested in, she said. There are all kinds of knots, you know. The square knot, the half hitch, the figure eight, 
the bowline. She rattled off at least a dozen more. He finally decided on the timber hitch, and Anne Hazel tossed him a ball of twine. Practice with this, she said. Out of sight his aunt, of his aunt's prying eyes, he knotted the sticks together with the twine, one next to the other, until he had assembled a wide platform. And when he felt confident that it was solid, he dragged it down to the bank of the swale. And it was there for a fleeting moment that he began to doubt himself. Perhaps the men weren't after Maggie after all. Perhaps they were hunting for some large fish or an eel or a ferocious snapping turtle. It was possible that he had misunderstood them, of course. So he had to be sure that Maggie was really their target. Before he put his plan into motion, there couldn't even be a shadow of a doubt. Covering the raft with large green leaves, he left it hidden by the swale and crept back up under the stairs. He could hear Aunt Gladys talking inside the hut as she set the table for early dinner. Be a dear and call Brogdon inside, won't you, sister? She asked Aunt Hazel. He'll need to wash up before we eat. What with all that puttering around he's been doing this afternoon, I don't suppose you have any idea of what he's up to? Not at all. Only something with knots, said Aunt Hazel. Just a moment, dear. I must finish pressing this flower. Brogdon realized that this was his only chance before his aunts came looking for him, and it was too late. He slipped across the long grass and stood in front of the brown house. The lights were on inside, but the curtains were drawn, so it was impossible to see anything except the dark silhouettes of Mackie and Simp, who were in the front room. I guess this is where he can try to figure out whether they really are bad guys. The windows were slightly open, but from Brogdon's place in the grass, it was hard to make out what they were saying. Even if he went up the front steps, he still wouldn't be close enough to hear. Thinking quickly, his gaze fell upon the long metal gutter that ran vertically from the roof to the ground next to the front window. It's worth a try, Brogdon told himself. Aunt Hazel had taught him how to climb trees when he was very young. So he was able to shimmy up the gutter quite easily by holding on with his knees, reaching up and pulling with his arms, and then grabbing on with his leaves, knees again, and so on. Inch by inch, he scooted upward until he was eye level with the open window. He held on tight, suspended perhaps 10 feet above the ground, and didn't dare look down, for that would make him dizzy. A small breeze fluttered by him for a moment. The curtain blew aside and Brogdon got a grim view of the two men. Mackie was standing in the middle of the room, polishing some kind of harpoon. The blade flashed in the light and Simp was loading several dull brassy bullets into a rifle. Brogdon gasped aloud and almost lost his grip. Hey, did you hear something? Mackie asked, his eyes darting nervously from side to side. No, nah, Simp said, loading another bullet into the rifle. I'm sure I did, Mackie insisted. I'm going to go check it out. From where he hung on the gutter, Brogdon watched in fear as Mackie crossed the room and opened the front door. Brogdon held his breath and concentrated on remaining as still as possible while Mackie looked left. And then he looked to the right, left, right. And seeing no one, he went back inside. Phew, thought he was going to find Brogdon. Well, Simp asked, nobody's there, Mackie admitted. It must be my nerves. I won't be able to relax until we got the little monster. Simp patted the rifle and smiled an evil grin. Tomorrow's a big day, he said. We ought to get some rest. And Mackie? Yeah, just in case you have trouble falling asleep tonight. Count dollar bills, stacks and stacks of crisp green dollar bills. Brogdon, he cackled and held something up in front of Mackie's face. Brogdon couldn't see what it was. He leaned in closer toward the window. Take a good long look at this picture, Mackie, he whispered. Remember, tomorrow our lives change. Tomorrow she's ours. 
Just then another breeze drew the curtain aside and Brogdon could see what Simp was holding. It was a photo and there was no mistake. It was Maggie. Brogdon had to resist the urge to jump all the way to the ground below. He let go with his knees and holding onto the gutter with only his hands, slid down as quickly as he could. His hands were on fire by the time he reached the bottom, but he had no time to pay them any mind. His legs propelled him through the grass toward the door of his hut. Without pausing, he burst through it, panting breathlessly. His aunts were sitting at the table and by the looks of things had been waiting on him. Brogdon, Aunt Hazel scolded, what have we said about banging doors? And go wash up, it's time to eat. No, no time, he choked out. Oh, there's always time to wash up, Aunt Gladys retorted. Who knows what germs? It's okay, Brogdon, we don't mind waiting, Aunt Hazel interjected. You don't understand, he shouted. I've got to go. Go, both aunts cried. Go where? Back down the swale, he cried out over his shoulder. And he flew out the door without shutting it and made a beeline for the spot near the bank of the swale where the raft was hidden. His aunt stared at him as he left unaware of what he had just said, while the door swung freely on its hinges, creaking softly. And then, as if they'd been hit by lightning, both women jumped up from the table, toppling glasses and dishes as they scrambled out. No, Brogdon! No, they shrieked. Luckily for Brogdon, there were a few inches of water flowing in the swale. When he eased the raft in, it floated easily. He hopped on, and it began drifting along in the slight current. Both ants had caught up and were running along the bank of the swale, pleading with him. Don't go, Brogdon. We can't bear it. Please stop, they pleaded. I've got to save Maggie, he called back. The raft was picking up speed and his ants had to run even faster to keep up with him. Who's Maggie? Aunt Hazel yelled. She's a lock monster, but not a mean monster. She just looks like a monster. She's nice and friendly, and she's living in a tank in John and Elaine's house on Sunset Island. But these evil men have found her now that she's here in Lake Wahakmo, and they want to capture her and put her in an aquarium or a laboratory or worse. Oh, she's in the most terrible danger, and I have to warn them. He spilled out the words as fast as he could because the raft was only a few feet from the drop off. I'll be back, I promise, he reassured his aunts. The two women were huffing and puffing as they struggled to keep up. And then his aunts did something that he'd never anticipated when he set his plan into motion. Just as the raft was about to plunge over the drop, he felt it shudder as both aunts leaped from the bank of the swale and landed beside him. We're coming with you, Brogdon, Aunt Hazel stated firmly as the raft flew over the drop. And now Brogdon and both of his aunts, for the second time Brogdon, but for the first time his aunts, they've all gone down the swale. Hope you like that part. I loved that part. I'm glad you did. It was so exciting, and I never expected Brogdon's aunts to be on the raft with him. This is definitely going to be a different kind of adventure. And now we know Maggie's really in trouble. These guys are there to hunt her, and hopefully Brogdon can get out to Sunset Island somehow and warn them. Wow, that was a really exciting part. Well, come back tomorrow and let's find what find out what happens. Please come back tomorrow. See you then. Bye-bye.